So we have uh, these 2,000 node operators securing 180,000 RE. What happens when Atlas rolls around is that a large majority of these node operators who have already put 16 ETH up will now be able to convert into 8 ETH pools. If you if every 16 ETH pool converted to an 8 ETH pool, the amount of RE that the protocol could support triples. So this is going to be a huge watershed moment for the protocol. Hey, welcome to the Edge Podcast. I'm DeFi Dad, an investor and educator at Fourth Revolution Capital. And I could not be more excited to be joined by my first ever co-host. Uh, he's my good friend and colleague from 4RC. He goes by Nomadic. Adam, what's up, my friend? Pleasure to be here with you. How you doing? Stoked to be here. I uh, can't wait to talk to Jasper today. Uh, I think Jasper first came on my radar early last year. With some of the papers he started posting, the first one that caught my eye was, uh, I think it was one pool to rule them all. And then all the subsequent ones have been great. And yeah, just ready to dive into all things Rocket Pool with you. Excellent. Well, let's jump right into it. Uh, so to, to introduce Jasper, uh, he goes by Jasper the Friendly Ghost. Jasper is a prominent member of the Rocket Pool community. He has a number of roles, including former treasurer of the Protocol DAO, he is known now as the community advocate. He also serves on the incentives management committee. Part of the reason we're having this discussion is because Jasper recently published a number of papers on how Rocket Pool is poised to flip Lido as the number one ETH liquid staking protocol. And I would add to that it being permissionless, which is what really separates it. In case you are new to Rocket Pool, uh, we're going to talk all about that today. It's a decentralized and again, permissionless staking protocol on Ethereum uh, where users end up with the benefit of holding a liquid stake derivative, which you might have heard of an LSD, uh, which is called RETH. And so again, we'll cover all of that and more. Uh, without further ado then, Jasper, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining us. How you doing? I'm doing awesome. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here with you, DeFi Dad and Nomadic. Uh, I feel a bit honored to be your first guest as a duo. Oh, yeah. It couldn't be uh, a better way to kick this off. And hey, so let's start with the basics of, you know, how did you get involved in crypto? This this is sort of the background that we all will resonate with till the end of time, uh, <laughs> getting our start in crypto. So for me, I was actually quite young. Uh, I was in high school and sitting in economic class, uh, just goofing off on my laptop, watching Martin Shukali live streams. And this was when Bitcoin, after the 2013-2014 bull run, bent back down and first re-hit uh, $1,000. And then that was like, this is pretty cool. And it was just been deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole since. Uh, in college, I actually studied pre-medicine and philosophy. So I was sort of like this multidisciplinary mix of things, which I think was the right skill set uh, to transition deeper into crypto. So like a lot of people, I really went in with the 2017 bull market uh, and I really fell in love with crypto and its possibilities uh, with MakerDAO, with DAI. That was the first like zero to one uh, moment to me after Ethereum itself. That zero to one moment of being able to create a permi uh, permissionless currency and anyone in the world can use it. That was just like my blank to me. And so I was like all in, but then the market really crashed and then MakerDAO sort of uh, almost collapsed in its single collateral form. But then, I, after college ended for me, uh, and DeFi summer hit, my passion sort of came back around. And as I was perusing ETH Finance, a community I've been following since the ETH trader days, I started hearing rumblings that Rocket Pool was finally doing betas. This was uh, around January of 2021. A lot, of, a lot of my crypto interests at the time were philosophically rooted. Uh, I was a huge proponent of decentralization, permissionless, and you know, finding ways to change our capital system to better help people. And Rocket Pool was fundamentally around those same exact principles. And I remember my first time joining the community, I was talking about quadratic voting and like all these crazy ideas, and then the people there sort of resonated with me. So from that moment on, I was hooked. That's awesome. So 
I guess like what what drew you further into Rocket Pool and 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 how did you get so immersed in the community and and to become kind of where you are now? So early on, like say in 2021, I was definitely experimenting around with different communities, and I was really looking for the one that reflected my own personal values and presented a, a product that I thought was important to the future of the ecosystem. Right away, when I joined Rocket Pool, it was very value centric. Like these are the people that uh, run this full nodes for fun, right? A, a lot of them. And with the ecosystem the way it was when the beacon chain went live, your options were only solo staking. And that's it, right? You could use a liquid staking derivative, you could use a centralized exchange, but there was no avenue for those people who wanted to, you know, like truly be self sovereign, run their own node, or validate the network. And so in the absence of, having a proper outlet for these people, the Rocket Pool community sort of like coalesced everyone. Like all the solo stakers, everyone that wanted to really get involved with the network ended up coming into this one area. So when I sort of saw that happening, I, it was like a flywheel for me. Like, oh man, these people really care about the values. So I'm going to like stay with them and talk about the values. It, which is sort of like what ended up transpiring. Uh, around 2021, I started hosting Twitter spaces with Darren Langley, the general manager of Rocket Pool. Sorry, the beginning of 2022. I started hosting these uh, Twitter spaces. And this was a, the first way I was able to give back to the community in a real way. Uh, it's by, you know, like updating the community and talking about relevant happenings. After that moment, I sort of really embodied the permissionless nature of crypto and started taking my own steps into seeing how I can make Rocket Pool fit into uh, the broader ecosystem. The article you mentioned earlier, I wrote Nomadic, uh, one pool to rule them all. That was, I think, my first true like literary uh, publication in the space. And in that, I sort of outline my earliest critiques of the Lido system, as well as start on why Rocket Pool presents a fundamentally value-driven, better alternative. I actually want to drill down to the values that you've referenced and like, how does the rocket pool protocol reinforce that? But before we do, uh, why don't we talk about what is rocket pool as a protocol, some of the benefits as a, uh, as a permissionless liquid staking protocol. Sure. Let's start with liquid staking and staking more broadly. So on the Ethereum blockchain, you can stake and run a validator if you have 32 Ethereum, which is right now pretty expensive. I think that with the current today's pump, is close to $50,000. That's pretty prohibitive, right? So a lot of people who don't have that ability and also don't have the technical know-how to run a validator uh, end up usually choosing liquid staking derivatives. A liquid staking derivative is sort of like a coupon or an IOU statement. You give your ETH, your cold ETH, and in return you get a representation of that ETH, but someone else is staking it. So this is great for people who have less than 32 ETHs to get involved with the ecosystem. However, it comes with them trade-offs, right? There's that inherent trust assumption or potential inherent trust assumption if you are giving your ETH to someone else to stay on your path. What Rocket Pool does is it tries to maintain the original ethos of Ethereum, self-sovereignty, permissionlessness, decentralization, and censorship resistance. Well, how can you maintain those values while also having someone else stake on your behalf? This is sort of like the main ethos of Rocket Pool. Maintain permissionlessness, but lower the barrier to entry. So the way Rocket Pool does that is by creating a two-sided marketplace. In Ethereum, you only have the ability to run a validator, a solo validator. In Rocket Pool, you have that option. You can run a node, be truly self-sovereign, and there is an option to hold that coupon, that RETH token. That is our liquid staking derivative. What is really separating Rocket Pool from every other liquid stake, majority of liquid staking derivatives, is that when you deposit your RETH to be staked, it's not going to a central whitelisted entity. It's going to this huge, huge, I, I cannot understate, understate how huge this network is, uh, network of node operators who will all be sort of collectively securing your Ethereum. And for reference, Rocket Pool just celebrated passing 2,000 node operators. Uh, Lido, for reference, has 29. 
Coinbase has one, Frax has one. And just to drill down to that for a moment, why is that? Why, why does Rocket Pool have so many uh, node operators or validators versus the others? Sure. So Rocket Pool is permissionless fundamentally. It allows anyone to come in if they have 16 ETH and 1.6 ETH of RPL to run a node. So in Lido and in all the other major liquid state derivatives and centralized exchanges, the validators, like the people who truly run the hardware, are all whitelisted. And they're trusted and there's some obfuscation there, which can be good. It can result in higher yields because of higher uptime. But then you're fundamentally introducing tail risk, like there's a counterparty now. The only way to really mitigate this is to have a very distributed set of node operators so that there is no centralizing risk. Uh, an important metric to sort of understand this is if you take the entire amount of ETH staked and you divide it by the total number of node operators, how much ETH is actually staked per node operator? Like, what is that level of risk there? Because if you do get slashed on a node or something bad happens, it's all the ETH that's staked on that node is sort of at risk. So Rocket Pool is fundamentally about resisting tail risk and doing so in its permissionless nature. There's, of course, some trade-offs with this, uh, scaling being the most important one. With Lido, for example, Steve can be infinitely minted. You can take 100,000 ETH, 200,000 ETH if you're three arrows capital, and mint Steve with that. And then slowly over time, they will distribute that ETH to their validators because they don't really have this hiccup where you have to find permissionless nodes to run the validators. But with Rocket Pool, we are maintaining a two-sided marketplace so that no one entity has too much control over state. Awesome. Yeah. Love that breakdown and description there, Jasper. Um, so on our ETH, can you kind of just go into the benefits of holding our ETH and then just how does the token, how does it accrue ETH staking yield? So our ETH is a C token model. So that is a reference to compound. Uh, and the, the major important thing to know about this is that the value of our ETH trends up with time. So it's, it's literally up only. It's one of the few things that in this ecosystem I'm safe I'm safely able to say is up only against ETH. Uh, it is not a rebasing token. So if you have, if you staked one R ETH on the day Rocket Pool launched, uh, you would chain, exchange one ETH for one R ETH. Now, since many months have passed, that R ETH is worth much more than one ETH. So that's the token design. Some other things to really keep in mind about the token is that it is, to my understanding, the most insured uh, liquid staking derivative token. So majority of other liquid staking tokens, if there is a mass slashing event, if there is really intense downtime for a very long time, projected amount, or if there is a client bug, it is going to be the the LSD token holders, the Steve holders, the Frax ETH holders, the CV ETH holders who flip the bill. Whereas with Rocket Pool, there's built-in insurance. It's funny, you Jasper, you really started to cover uh, my follow-up, which was about the, the risk uh, of holding our ETH versus other LSDs of ETH. And I, I, I think you mostly covered it, but do you want to elaborate at all on like why Rocket Pool made it so hard, I think, to, to kickstart the flywheel with requiring 16 ETH uh, for those who wanted to run a validator or node, and then uh, having to put up, and, and correct me if I'm not getting the details right here, uh, having to put up 1.6 ETH of RPL, like, why is that all there? What, what does that do to protect those who are using Rocket Pool? Yeah, so absolutely. Uh, in my latest article, uh, why, I, why I Believe Paradigm Was Wrong, How Our ETH Will Flip Steve, uh, I sort of break the category of risk for LSD tokens into three components. Uh, the first one is execution risk. This is shared across all LSD tokens. So this is like being properly compliant with the withdrawals hard for, uh, not having smart contract bugs. What I thought was really interesting and what I talked about in the paper is you can track how execution risk was priced out. When the merge happened, pegs across the board collapsed, like they got closer to peg. Uh, the discounts for LSD tokens dropped 
and it's completely rational, right? One of the most important events was uh, security intense events just was successful. Uh, so that was one aspect, the execution. And then there are two other more esoteric risks that I think are not talked about enough. And these are centralization risk and tail risk. Tail risk is uh, somewhat of a broad category and covers the things that I was just talking about. Uh, quadratic leaks, uh, slashing events more broadly, downtime, uh, although downtime is not really a tail risk, it, it's really not that big a deal for most cases. Uh, but what is important to know is that the tail risk, while extremely unlikely to happen, a lot of them can be very devastating. And an LSD token is sort of, in principle, should be able to sit there for 50 years and properly accrue value, right? Well, if there are tail risks like slashings, which do happen, there have been, I think, 200 slashings on the beacon chain. Uh, you, you have to sort of factor in that in, like, what are the chances that these trusted operators mess up? Block Tower Capital, I believe that is what their name is, a major validator that uh, experienced a huge amount of downtime following the merge, which lost revenue for their holders. So the tail risk category is one of the more important ones. And then lastly is centralization risk, which is sort of the idea that the larger an LSD's share of the entire Ethereum state grows, the more of a risk it poses to the ecosystem. And we saw this sort of play out with the Steeth peg collapse. Uh, Steeth, while not quite as dominant at the time, uh, was close to 30% of the vegan chain and took down a large chunk of the DeFi sector when its peg collapsed by 10%. Well, that was purely economic forces driving that. Imagine there was a smart contract bug or a mass slashing event. In that scenario, we might see a much, much larger cascading event. So those are the three categories of risk. And when Rocket Pool launched, it was quite difficult to evaluate these kinds of risks. Uh, and so the team took a more conservative approach and launched with 16 ETH as their minimum, which is still a huge improvement. At the time, your only option to run a validator was 32 full ETH. So when they launched, they took the conservative approach uh, with 16 ETH and they still found massive uptake from the community. Uh, again, 2,000 node operators, despite what is seemingly a very capital inefficient system. And I think a large part of that comes back to this focus on minimizing risk, minimizing tail risk, and minimizing counterparty risk. The community of node operators uh, writ large, so like all node operators on the crypto ecosystem, generally tend to be very risk averse people. And it, it is difficult to entice them to put up their ETH at risk without sharing these risk averse values. So when the Rocket Pool team launched, I think they were trying to really put forward the idea that they are taking risks seriously. Like you are safe if you run validators with us. In time, research is starting to suggest that the 16A requirement, this over 100% insurance for ARI holders, might be excessive. And so in the coming upgrade in Atlas, we're going to be dro dropping that down. But in a risk value assessment, I think that's the much better rep. It's way better to start super, super safe, do research, and then reduce your uh, comfort barrier than it would, excuse me, than it would be to try to launch where you think that comfort barrier should be. So nowadays we are seeing staking protocols launch with four ETH bonds, eight ETH bonds, sort of building off of what Rocket Pool has laid down the foundations of. But these protocols are still having the difficulty capturing node operator mindshare. And it is much easier for Rocket Pool to reduce requirements than it is to build a new mindshare. You mentioned the Atlas upgrade, uh, which will lower the bond requirement from 16 ETH to 8 ETH. How will that impact Rocket Pool? What what do you expect uh, to result from from this upgrade? So this is going to be a huge watershed moment for the protocol. And let's start with some math. So we have uh, these two thousand node operators securing, I think it is three or uh, one hundred and eighty thousand about our ETH, roughly. Uh, it could be a little bit higher than that now. What happens when Atlas? rolls around is that 
a large majority of these node operators who have already put 16 ETH up will now be able to convert into 8 ETH pools. When the way the math works out is if you if every 16 ETH pool converted to an 8 ETH pool, the amount of R ETH that the protocol could support triples. So that is the first aspect of Atlas. We are going to be lowering the 8 ETH bond amount, or the bond amount from 16 to 8, which creates a threefold increase in the R ETH supply. Another major part of Atlas is the introduction of uh, withdrawals and support for withdrawals. So the major cohort or supply boost from that is going to be from solo staker migration. Rocket Pool launched fairly late compared to the majority of liquid staking programs. Uh, the Beacon Chain staking went live December of 2020. Rocket Pool did not go live until November of 2021. That means a lot of these sort of diehard Ethereums, which is really the same community as Rocket Pool, have ETH staked that they might want to migrate over. Roughly 30% of all ETH staked currently is held by these Genesis stakers, really early whales. These people will now, for the very first time, have the opportunity to convert their solo nodes into rocket pool nodes. And by converting a full 32 ETH validator into 8 ETH LEPs, uh, each one sort of creates 4x the the supply is about 120 R ETH per validator that's converted. So Atlas and withdrawals will really, really increase the supply throughput that the protocol can handle. So on that, can you can you kind of go into the relationship with the RPL token and sort of the changes that Atlas will bring with um, how how much of the RPL token validators need to hold now um, on the on that side of the equation? Yeah. So the RPL token, which I don't think we actually talked about much yet, uh, it is integral to the system. So not only do you have to bond ETH, you have to bound RPL. And you also earn rewards for that RPL. I believe the current RPL APR is somewhere between 9 and 11%, uh, which is higher than the ETH staking APR. Originally, that RPL was thought of as extra security, uh, and it's still thought of as extra security. Uh, moving forward, it seems like the most likely scenario for RPL to be used within the protocol is going to be MEV stealing auctions. So this is getting a little bit technical, but when you have a node at a validator, you are probably going to be opted into MEV boost. And so you have 8 ETH sitting on, their, on your validator, and you get this lottery block coming in for 11 ETH. It's game theoretically optimal for you to abandon that validator and run away with the 11 ETH. The RPL bond sort of adds cushion in these scenarios. Like if the entire node is going to be written off, RPL can be auctioned off to make up some of that gap. And really this only is possible in MEV theft. So Atlas is going to be changing how RPL, how much RPL is required. We are reducing the ETH bond from 16 ETH to 8 ETH, right? Off the top of the head that off the top that immediately cuts down the ARP ETH backing pretty substantially. As a result, it's in the protocol, protocol's best interest to replace some of that lost insurance with RPL. So we can sort of increase the value proposition of the token by making it more prominent as collateral. The protocol has decided to use a floor of 10% of borrowed ETH, uh, protocol ETH, for the floor. So with it at 8 ETH, you would have to put up 8 ETH and 2.4 ETH of RPL. So your exposure to RPL is actually going to have to increase. However, uh, there's a lot of good reason you would want to have that RPL exposure. Most importantly, it allows you to get exposure to four validators, right? That 2.4 ETH of RPL quadruples your chance at catching MEV. It unlocks the access to commission, which is huge. So why do people run nodes for Occupy in the first place? Well, they get 15% commission on half the ETH at stake right now. So they put up 16 ETH and they get 15% of all the yield that the other half of that validator earns, which is higher than Lido or, or other competitors, but not too high to uh, push back or suppress our ETH demand. 
so yeah, one one thing that as you were talking there, I I just couldn't help but think like it would seem that the buy pressure potentially on RPL only really goes up, uh, especially as Atlas comes into play, and these validators are required to up their exposure to RPL. Is am, am I like am I looking at that right? Yeah. So right now there is a range of collateral, so you can only stake between ten and one hundred fifty percent of your ETH bond. So right now, if with 16 ETH, that translates to a minimum of 1.6 ETH and a maximum of 24 ETH of RPL. And you earn rewards only in that range. Uh, which is notice, what's notable about that is there's a good number of validators that have over 30% of RPL already staked. And because of that, they are going to able, be able to seamlessly, seamlessly uh, split their validator without having to buy new RPL. However, you are correct. If you're currently running a 16 ETH validator with under 30% collateral with RPL, you would have to buy new more RPL in order to unlock the benefits of Atlas. So there is actually a lot of debate about this, how much RPL collateral should be required. So if you're interested in this, there's some great governance threads about it. Uh, it was really a, uh, a battle in the community to figure out exactly how much rent the protocol should be uh, taxing. Is this part of the reason then that uh, Rocket Pool doesn't take any part of that 15% commission? Because that that surprised me when I was first learning about Rocket Pool. I, I thought, well, what's in it for Rocket Pool? Like, how does this protocol continue to grow by, I want to say, capturing value for those who are, are loyal to the protocol? Who are using that RPL token, but I, I think you've clearly covered it. There is, uh, I want to call it like a flywheel of of buying pressure now on it. The more the more validators that get stood up, especially with this Atlas upgrade with eight ETH, so that that much less, that many more validators means that much more RPL is being you know purchased or at least having to be locked up. Uh, that then acts as I want to call it like an insurance against slashing events, even though it's it's not the most appropriate term, but it it, it it's close enough. I I think I mean to point out that this is all working really well now. But have you reflected on just like the sort of friction this created when Rocket Pool was first getting started? Like there was a lot of criticism of the token design when when it first launched, right? When the protocol launched. Uh... It was in the middle of the bull market, so there was a bit of mania. But after that initial mania sort of subsided, uh, growth really slowed down. And there were questions about, uh, is this to do with the RPL requirement, or is it sort of due to the macro effects? And looking back, so we see this huge rush of staking in November of 2021 when the protocol launches. And that sort of extends, extends, but then falls off into around the January, February point of the 2022. And the real limitation at that point wasn't on the validator side. There was actually a lot of demand for people to spin up mini pools. People wanted to. However, we were lacking in our ETH demand. So while the protocol was perhaps less capital efficient at launch, there was such a vacuum in the space that it was still super attractive. And we were not able to keep up with the our ETH demand. What changed is in March of 22, uh, I released that one pool to rule them all, which was actually part of a broader movement, which was to integrate RE into DeFi properly. Uh, so I, along with some other people, uh, organized the launch of a curve pool at the time uh, between RE and Wrapped Steve. And this is the first dual LSD token pairing. And it was essentially a zero IL pool with full staking exposure and Tetranode uh, was very gracious at the time to throw a huge amount of curve incentives that way. And when you go back and you look at the sort of Rocket Pool TBL chart over time, you see March, another sort of like logarithmic growth phase had started because we now had access to the ARI demand, thanks in part to uh, newfound DeFi integrations. But ARI was still pretty nascent at the time, and uh, that ARI demand sort of was expired within the next two months. And then May happened and the economy collapsed, right? 
uh, every LSD, unfortunately, fell under PEG. And again, it was the RETH demand that was holding the protocol back. Uh, going further with these DeFi liquidity incentives, this was a part of what allowed Lido to grow uh, to be so so enormous um, in terms of the market share of LSDs. Also being first to market to uh, first mover advantage was just enormous. And the fact that once ETH goes into the beacon chain, uh, you know, it does not come back out. Uh, how have things changed? Uh, because you referenced that, that curve pool and I, I have wondered like how much more dry powder do we know that, uh, Lido has in terms of their own token incentives, their own, uh, ability to, uh, to allocate curve or convex rewards. And then is Rocket Pool alloc uh, is Rocket Pool accruing convex tokens? Then, like, is there a war chest there to incentivize the um, R ETH pools? Rocket Pool has a very different philosophy around staking or uh, liquidity incentives compared to other staking protocols. For the majority of the protocol's history, there were zero RPL incentives for liquidity, and that only changed uh, of just about five months ago. Uh, uh, part of my inauguration into Treasure was also the creation of the Incentive Management Committee, uh, which is the first time we started using RPL to incentivize liquidity. What's really been our focus with it is to be efficient with how we spend. So while Lido and other protocols might have a, the modus operandi of maximizing growth and TVL capture, Rocket Pool is more about sustaining growth minimizing expenditure, and being ready to adapt to new and novel uh, advances. So, uh, for instance, the uh, a fellow friend of mine on the Incentive Management Committee did a short analysis and found that if Lido continues to spend at the rate it's spending, it only has enough LDO tokens for about two years, uh, whereas Rocket Pool has enough tokens to last its current uh, incentivization scheme for over four years. Another aspect of that is that we find that withdrawals is going to completely change how the liquidity game works for liquid staking tokens. Uh, I am personally very bullish on uh, concentrated liquidity, or sorry, concentrated AMM. Uh, so I believe Uniswap V3 is going to really push forward how dense we can create liquidity with minimal capital costs. Uh, what's important about withdrawals in relation to this is that LSD tokens sort of wander around a peg. They have a peg, but usually the DEX price is not that. Our ETH, Rocket Pool ETH, has consistently held a premium, whereas most other tokens have held discounts. Uh, we believe that because of the massive amount of supply that's going to be unlocked with the Atlas upgrade, that our ETH will sort of sit pretty close to directly on peg and stay there for quite some time. That's really useful for concentrated liquidity. Uh, if you have these tight bands, you don't really need too much RPL incentive to create some pretty deep liquidity. And when Rocket Pool is trying to create liquidity, it's doing it for safety of users, to enable people to move in and out of positions, and to uh, create safe DeFi integrations. It is specifically not to make RE higher yield and not to attract TVL. So I think that difference in mentality is going to reflect itself moving forward where Rockful is really quick to change how its incentivization schemes works to what is most efficient, uh, really just to create the DeFi base layer upon which the community can build the rest. I think DAI is another one to look at where the community, the the crypto community itself sort of valued the decentralized properties and were willing to take on some capital risk to make sure it was successful. We're seeing some of the same things play out with our ETH. Uh, the incentive management committee traditionally will accept co-incentivization schemes where we match only like 10 to 20% of the inflation that other parties are giving us. So this sort of mechanism where other people are paying for a lot of Rocket Pool's liquidity has bootstrapped uh, some sustainable growth. 
I love that answer, Jasper. Like it sounds like Rocket Pool's approach to the DeFi integrations is much more kind of building for the long term, more like being adults in the room, getting away from some of this degeneracy that, you know, we've all seen. I have a hunch that a lot of that is going to come to light, like kind of post Shanghai, even just leading up to Shanghai, people are going to be vying for, you know, doing some crazy incentive mechanisms. But I, I, I like the approach that, that you're using and just kind of staying that course of, hey, we're, if, if, we're, if we're in a pool, why are we in a pool? We're doing it for efficiency. We're doing it for users. We're doing it for, you, you know what I mean? Like, um, so that, that's a great answer. I think, I think I want to pivot just back a bit to some things we were talking about earlier. And just could you go into kind of how Rocket Pool, the protocol, just reinforces those values of Ethereum that you re- referenced before, just self-sovereignty, uh, permissionlessness, uh, censorship resistance, and yeah. Yeah, let's take them all in order. And uh, since you said censorship resistance, let's start with that one. Uh, Rocket Pool node operators have a choice of many different relays. Uh, on top of that, they have the choice of every single major client, both on the execution side and on the uh, consensus side. So Rocket Pool smart node users, the people running these validators, have an incredible amount of freedom and choice in deciding how they want to be securing the network. We have nodes that are fully OFAC compliant. They are censoring transactions, and that's their prerogative. Perhaps they're US citizens, citizens that have uh, very high or very low risk tolerance, right? Well, that's fine that if they want to. At the same time, we have an overwhelming majority of nodes who have diverse clients, no OFAC censorship, that are self-sovereign and fully in their own right. Uh, in providing censorship resistance for our holders. So Rocket Pool is truly about censorship resistance in that it's allowing you to be censoring if you want, right? The, the, the truest form of censorship resistance is giving full control to the user. Uh, and Rocket Pool does that more than anyone else. What really drives that point home is during the Ethereum client scares, right? Oh no, Prism is like 75% of the beacon chain. Oh no, Geth is 90% of the execution layer. Rocket Pool did more than anyone else, by far. Uh, the Rocket Pool client diversity immediately it was like Nimbus, uh, Lodestar, all these minority clients. And it, a large chunk of our success in, in creating beacon chain diversity, I think, comes from the, that Rocket Pool uh, censorship resistance either. Permissionlessness. Anyone anywhere in the world can come with their 16 ETH and RPL and spin up a node and register. Uh, we have this really beautiful community of people from all over the world. You can go on the Rocket Pool website and there's this network back network map that lets you see how many nodes are on each continent. And isn't that just a great thing to say? We have nodes on almost every single continent. More nodes than most all L1s. Uh, and so in the, per being permissionless, we sort of just embody the ethereum ecosystem like uh, we have what's called a hybrid mode where if you're running a solo validator you can run a rocket pool validator on top and we have a ton of these users because the communities are are really neck and neck so they're like this uh decentralization rocket pool has played the long game they could have launched early and done a fully centralized entity while waiting for the tech to finish to decentralize but they did it because they weren't willing to sacrifice and rush uh rocket pool is in some respects the first liquid staking protocol because it was designed originally back in 2017 uh, when the ico happened for the original ethereum staking contract however they had to restart back over and when the beacon chain launched they had a choice do we launch with central validators that will take on ETH just like Lido with the promise of later on decentralizing, or do we do it right from the beginning? And just like Ethereum itself, they wanted to do it right from the beginning. So in that sense, they embody this decentralized ethos. Uh, Permissionless, censorship resistant, decentralized, and self-sovereign, right. When you hold RE, uh, it is yours. You're really beholden to very few parties. Uh, disclaimer, there is an Oracle DAO. So there's just some limitations 
based on the Ethereum spec, where, uh, for example, the the condensed layer cannot read the execution layer. So it's kind of hard to keep track of balances. This is just eventually going to become easier. Uh, however, for the time being, it requires some kind of Oracle service. Uh, so Rocket Pool has an ethos of, we will have this Oracle service, which is centralized. There is about 13 parties on it, all the Ethereum clients, Anthony Sassano, Superfiz, re really like major entities uh, at their scan consensus. Uh, but they're doing the minimum amount needed, just just enough so that the protocol can function with the long-term intent of hopefully minimizing the Oracle DAO and reliance on it to one day be truly, truly zero counterparty risk. And of course, on the node operator side, well, that's true self-sovereignty. You're running your node. It's your ETH. Uh, you control all your keys. And yeah. I think what you called out there are non-transferable features of Rocket Pool. There are lots of features that can be copied, uh, and they will be copied because, again, Rocket Pool's clearly set a standard. Which we encourage. We need more Rocket Pool-like entities. And, and, and to be fair, too, there's lots that we have all learned from the likes of Lido as well, and I think the CBETH uh, design has, has been fairly clever as well. One thing in the rocket pool design that I thought was confusing when I first like learned about it, and and I'm wondering, it like, where do you see the pros and cons of of the R ETH design today? If if you're new to Steph by Lido, you can go mint it one to one. So you put in one ETH, you get one Steph back out, and it's a rebasing token. So if it sits in my wallet at some point, I don't know if it happens once a day or many times a day, but you're continually being dripped more staff. And and so there, there's a, a very clear and cut sense of I'm getting more and more of this because I'm, I'm getting this, this staking yield. Um, the issue there, of course, is that could be, depending on what jurisdiction you live in, that could be also a taxable event. Anyways, throw that aside. Then we've got our ETH, which has, I, I want to say, continually traded at a higher and higher premium. And yeah, I'd, I'd love for you just to kind of explain that. Maybe like, again, what are some of the benefits to this? Because on simplestakers.info, which is a, a fantastic website to see like the different LSDs, um, just the way that our ETH is designed, you can be put off by this premium if you don't understand why it's there and, and essentially like how the token works. So anyways, if you can help us break that down. The our ETH design definitely diverges from where Lido started. And I think there's a lot of beneficial trade-offs here. So let me first acknowledge the fact that, yes, it is a bit confusing at first. However, I think uh, UX around wallets should be the thing that really fixes that. I think what's more important for the token is simplicity of design and integrations. So right off the bat, Rocket Pool's RE token has been natively supported on Arbitrum, Optimism, Polygon, ZK Sync for months. Because it's such a simple ERC-20. It doesn't have this weird rebasing mechanic where you have to keep track and update their balance. like almost block by block, right? That is actually really onerous, onerous on some protocols and can break integrations. So while yes, you have this uh, perspective inefficiency where some people see the token and don't immediately know how much of it they own in the ETH terms, uh, we have much broader DeFi accessibility. And then we actually think that a lot of like staking exposure is going to be abstracted away. Things like MetaMask, things like Argent, where you actually still end up just seeing your ETH balance and all this stuff is just in the background. So in that sense, we prioritize simplicity in design and integration. With over 170 million TVL cross-chain, the multi-chain liquid staking protocol Stator Labs is just about to launch the ETH liquid staking token ETHX. ETHX will give you the best of decentralized staking and DeFi yields. What's more is that anyone can permissionlessly run an ETHX node with just a 4 ETH bond. 
To get more alpha on the ETHX launch, go to staterlabs.com slash Ethereum. I kind of want to take it back to something I saw recently. Uh, I think it was on Twitter. I saw this recent governance vote that went up, uh, RPIP17, and I believe it's around like the Rocket Pool protocol self-limiting kind of how much market share they would uh, eventually take in, in the LSD ecosystem. Could you just kind of dive into that a little bit for us, uh, Jasper? Yeah. I'm so proud of the Rocket Pool community, Rock community for this. And this has been a, a long-term effort. This is not something that just sort of like came out of the, the blue. Uh, months ago, the, the ecosystem had a scare. Uh, Lido Steve hit 33%, and we started having to deal with these existential questions like, when is a, when are LSD tokens too large? Uh, so Danny Ryan had a great post called the risk of LSDs, which is really what termed the LSD token. And the community from that moment on started talking about this the idea of self capping, soft capping, hard capping, and what values and principles should guide that decision. Uh, and so in the ensuing months, we started talking about that. And one of the things that really shone through from the discussion is that these ideas of self-limitation should be established early. Uh, first and foremost, code is not law. Values are law. It's All that matters is the social community and what they ascribe. Because you could code a soft cap, and the day you hit it or the day before you hit it, if the social community wants to, they could take it out. What is harder is to shift values. So by establishing our values as being against self-limiting now, we sort of reduce that risk later on down the line. So the major tenets of this proposal or what it's built around are, is this idea of how healthy is the ecosystem. In the ideal case, we have a bunch of permissionless censorship resistant decentralized liquid staking tokens that all have somewhere between 10 and 20% of the stake. That would be ideal. And in that world, we would probably start self capping rocket pool already at 16 or so percent. Now, there's a full proposal with, that goes more in detail with the numbers. However, the more we deviate away from that world, the more we come to, the, unfortunately, the world we exist in now, the higher we sort of set the ceiling. And so really the self-capping is ecosystem dependent. We want to fundamentally make sure that we are doing best for Ethereum. If every other liquid staking protocol is centralized, then it's sort of okay for us to have an outside share because again, we are truly permissionless. However, the more good alternatives there are, the more we can sort of cut our stake before we get any of those risks of theoretical governance collusion, smart contract risk. Uh, and it's important to know that even a fully de-governed liquid staking token, like if there was no governance, it's still a risk if it hits 33%. Just the smart contract itself the nature of the validators, uh, it's a really difficult thing to push any protocol ever having over 33% of the state. Quick follow-up to that. We've only talked about, you know, what happens as uh, more validators are stood up, more ETH is staked with Rocket Pool. Uh, what would you expect if, uh, if, for any reason, ETH was shuffling out of Rocket Pool into whatever other protocol. Um, what would happen with our ETH, and then anything to consider there with kind of the reverse of the flywheel, the very happy flywheel flywheel we talked about with RPL, uh, when uh, there is less our ETH or less ETH being staked. Sure. So one of the major and uh innovations for Rocket Pool in this past year is the Rocket Arc contract. And this allows users who spin up new validators to profit off of the RE premium and sort of incentivizes new validators based on how much demand there is for RE in the open market. It's very likely that we're going to have a reverse of this. Uh, and I believe designs have already been uh, started, wherein if RE is trading at a discount, we will be able to use that market inefficiency to incentivize people to pull out stake. And it is important that that option is there. We don't want it to be a black hole. Rocket Pool is fundamentally driven towards protecting Ethereum. And if for some reason uh, the ecosystem demands that Rocket Pool stake go down, we are going to be reflexive to that. 
we're going to make that naturally possible. And it's important to know that uh, RE is one of the only LSD tokens which you can actually burn right now. Like you can go into the deposit pool and get the exact amount of ETH that you are owed right now, which is not true for any other liquid staking tokens. They're all only traded on DEX markets. So the ability to pull stake out has already sort of been implanted into the protocol design because again, the protocol isn't growth maximalist. It's security maximalist. It's Ethereum maximalist. So, uh, but to sort of extend that, like, yes, if all the, all the ETH flew out of the protocol for some reason, like the protocol was hacked, we would naturally see a huge amount of RPL cell pressure. I was not aware of that ARB pool mechanism. I, I find I am continually surprised by like all the other sort of innovations that, that come out of rocket pool. And I do think it speaks to, there's a quality that I know we, we, Adam and I look for, you know, in terms of investing that fourth revolution capital, you know, we're looking for founders who want to do nothing other than just focus on the thing that they are building. I don't want to work, you know, with founders who want to work on 20 different projects. I want folks who just want to obsess over this. And this is so important to the health and future of Ethereum, like a, the, the decentralized future that, you know, I think we are all very aligned around. So, uh, yeah, I, I think the, the proof is in the pudding there <laughs> in some of what you've shared. And, and just to kind of follow up on that, I'm, I'm glad you brought up Rocket R because that's actually something I came across uh, actually in one of your, your, your latest paper, um, kind of talking about those quality of life upgrades and so, sort of like those subtle differentiators that really set Rocket Pool apart from, I, I don't want to say competition, but some of the LSD providers and and, and, and actually Rocket Arb is is surprisingly powerful. Like I think if you really see what sort of uh, influence it's going to have for drawing in uh, more staked ETH and more more validators and things like that. So glad you brought that up. Yeah, just on the on just a quick note on the quality of life thing. There, there's a huge suite of quality uh, upgrade that are only available to Rocket Pool validators. There is the smoothing pool, which smooths out all MEV and is actually positive EV if you're a small operator. There is the rescue node, which allows you to, without DVT technology, have this other party back up your node if you ever go down, so you never miss high test stations. There is rocket art, so that some people were able to make half an ETH, almost half an ETH, for Logica Validator for free. So yeah, these are just the quality of life upgrades that have already come out. The Grants and Bounties Commission just started paying people. The, the Rockful community is this massive and this productive with zero funding. And we just started funding people. So <laughs> I'll let you draw your conclusions from that. Definitely impressive. Um, I, I want to, before we, like, before we wrap, I definitely want to get this question in. Um, so Eigenlayer has been a hot topic lately in kind of the, the crypto streets. Uh, how do you foresee that impacting Rocket Pool? Are there synergies there? Is there potentially any better alignment with Rocket Pool than possibly some other LSDs? Uh, could could you just kind of riff on that for just a bit? So I have this article titled uh, "The Layer Zero Bull Case," uh, and essentially about how Rocket Pool's focus on a community of actual physical node operators is going to pay dividends in the future. Uh, that is, the Rocket Pool network is in many ways a for hire validator service that is stronger than most existing alternative layer ones. And that's an incredible achievement. However, there's no way to access that market. Like we have this, we know it's permissionless and we know it's super decentralized with a ton of real operators, but we don't have another way to tap into that market. It's just, we just stayed. Eigenlayer creates a market for that to be accessed, which is a total new movement. Um, Eigenlayer is still a lot of theory crafting, so everything I'm saying is take it with a bit of salt, a little grain of salt. But uh, from the perspective of, let's say, an oracle, when you have a one of n trust assumption, or say, a like x of n trust assumption, you don't really care about the amount of TVL you have locked. What you care about is the number, is your n, right? If you're a one of n trust assumption, you care about your n. 
how many actual operators are in this network. So with the rocket pool eigenlayer synergy is that if you are one of these Oracle services and you want to immediately bootstrap your network with a ton of node operators, you have an easy flag for that. Just go to rocket pool. Just take, uh, take in the rocket pool network. You, it's, you know, it's super decentralized, you know, it's permissionless and you're able to get your goals, uh, fairly quickly. So how this plays out in the long run is going to be a bit trickier as we have to now consider risk curves, uh, an Oracle service, you can't really get slashed, like, right. Uh, you might have a little extra bond, but you're not putting your whole amount of capital at risk because there's no MEV involved or anything like that. So it's really lowest to add on. However. That's not the limit of what Eigenlayer can unlock. You know, Eigenlayer in many respects is like DeFi, a new world of DeFi built on top of just Ethereum staking. And just like DeFi, there will be Ponzi's, there will be collapses, and there will be pain, unfortunately. So while you might have this sort of like really robust set of extra yield for Rockable node operators, one day in the next bull run, we might come across someone like, uh, Flax ETH, Flax, F L A X ETH, that incentivizes their liquid staking derivative with a ton of this sort of uh, complex eigenlayer stuff that's obfuscated away, which might not really be sustainable. And at a stable coin on top of that, say you're now not only doing this restaking, but you're also minting a stable coin to allow extra leverage on it. Well, you've just recreated Anchor. But not only have you recreated Anchor, you're putting Ethereum protocol health in jeopardy. So I'm very excited for Eigenlayer. I think it is, I think Rocket Pool and Eigenlayer are the most synergistic LSD pairings possible, but I am worried that Eigenlayer will unleash more than we expect. It kind of sounds like a recipe for a DeFi revival. Do you, do you expect that from ETH LSDs and I guess what's coming with Eigenlayer? Yeah, I think. There's a few like really big catalysts that are coming together to put LSD tokens into this like exalted new category. Uh, the first one is going to be withdrawals. We're de-risking at an institutional level, and that's going to unlock a huge amount of capital to flow in. The second thing that comes from that is the pegs are going to be much, much tighter, which means risks and deviations are much, much less. Uh, so leveraging is going to become much safer. We've also seen a huge wave of fixed market lending and fixed market hyper staking. So, excuse me, uh, yield protocol, uh, MISO finance, and a few others, uh, allow people to borrow only ETH against our ETH and isolating this market with fixed terms. They've created Oracle free liquidation, free leveraged staking products, which is the, uh, an insane amount of yield potential. And what's really going to limit that yield potential are the tail risks, are the potentials for collapse. Because you're going to have protocols that are like, oh, we can leverage up 5x. Nothing happens. Oh, can you go 10x now? Now we can go 25x. But then you have that one slashing event and you realize your entire house of cards is going to collapse. And I, I maintain that RE is the most tail risk resistant out of any protocol. I think before we let you go, I would just love if you can share maybe any morsels of of alpha uh, on Rocket Pool to our listeners. If if you if you've got anything to share, no no pressure though. Oh yeah, I've got tons of stuff. Let's see. So the R E exchange volumes have been on an up only trajectory, right? And uh, oracles really like exchange volumes. So if the exchange volumes are doing really well. Maybe we get some oracles, some good oracles soon. Another thing is uh, the team, this is more public, is officially finishing work on uh, oracle feeds for Optimism, Polygon, and ZK Sync 2. So we also, on the Incentive Management Committee, have been getting uh, requests for partnerships on some other layers. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> Jasper, you know it's good alpha when I was literally just making notes. <laughs> so that that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jasper, I think this is probably a great place for us to to wrap up and 
as expected, this was just a total joy. I, I really appreciate, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. I mean, you are truly one of the most expert people in the world when it comes to Rocket Pool. And I think sometimes we forget just because this is like the bubble we all live in, the world we live in, uh, just you know how early and how small our community still is. So. Um, like I said, it, it's it's a privilege to get to uh, to ask you all these questions. If someone wants to follow uh, your future uh, posts, reports, uh, papers, uh, where should they follow you? How should they get in touch? Yeah, so if you want to follow my papers, I publish everything usually in the massive Twitter threads. Uh, you can find me at, at uh, Jasper underscore Eat on Twitter. But I spend majority of my time hanging out with the incredible Rocket Pool community in the trading channel of the Discord. There are literally thousands of the brightest people in the Ethereum ecosystem. You will walk in and people will be talking about like the etymologies of Latin words while another person is talking about dick butts and a third person is providing support for a new node operator. All simultaneously without any like uh, friction. It's just, it's there's no other community like it. And I think, it, again, it just touches on the values. The Ethereum values are Rocket Pool values. They are synonymous. Awesome. I, I personally love that we got a dick butt <laughs> yes. comment in there, too. It. And and I I've, actually been, <laughs> I've actually been in your Discord a lot the past few weeks. And sure. just a quick shout out to uh, Maverick and Valdor oh, yeah. have answered oh, yeah. so many of my noob questions, but with just amazing expertise. So... Uh, kudos for those two. Awesome. Well, hey, uh, thanks to everyone for tuning in. Uh, quick reminder too, if you enjoyed, uh, if you enjoyed the show, don't forget to subscribe uh, at the Edge Podcasts wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts. Uh, you can also find links to the shows uh, in the future at defydad.com. But anyways. Jasper, thanks again, man. Great to meet you. Look forward to uh, just getting to work with you, hopefully on future endeavors through the Rocket Pool community. Yeah, man, this has been a pleasure. Thank you both DeFi Dad and Nomadic for having me. Uh, wonderful conversations. Thank you for uh, such great questions. Mm -hmm.